This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Our speaker is Thomas Ricks. He's a journalist by profession, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, many years, many wars covered. He's an author, the students can identify, he's a blogger, and even mentioned the faculty club at Berkeley on his blog yesterday, which I was pleased to see, because he was talking to somebody. And he is also a senior fellow at the Center for a New American Security, a basically think tank back in Washington. He spends about half his year, he tells us, up in Maine, where he can go and hide and paddle a kayak to get over having written for you know, 6 a.m. till 3 p.m. or something like that. This is where he does his writing. The rest of his time is in Washington with the blog. For those of us who are members of the Military Officers Education Committee or otherwise Berkeley faculty members involved with ROTC, we have a variety of things that motivate our interest in the ROTC program. One of those things is the concept of leadership. In particular, it's our ROTC programs at Berkeley that are one of the few, probably not the only, but close to it, one of the few places that actually teach leadership to students on the campus. And we are all very proud of that fact and aware of that fact, and it's an important thing to us. And I think in terms of our speaker tonight, it's fair to say that what I've learned about him is that leadership tends to be what his books and writings are all about. Making of the Core, one of his first books, is about leadership that's exercised by that greatest of all the Marine Corps institutions, the drill instructor. More recently, his books Fiasco and Gamble are about leadership for better or for worse, at the highest levels of military command. The book he's currently working on, he says, is about generals, American, modern American generals. In his first lecture two nights ago, he asked the question of why were the American generals of World War II more successful than their successors that have followed them since then? His thesis on that was that it was because of the leadership of General Marshall as a general of the General Corps. Tonight, he's going to change gears a little bit and talk about one of the great Marine Corps generals of recent times who faced rather different circumstances than what Marshall Based. But the common denominator, I think, is going to prove to be leadership. The title for tonight's lecture is How O.P. Smith, UC Berkeley, class of 1916, saved 15,000 Marines. Please welcome Tom Ricks. Thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I want to begin it by asking one question. Before you heard about this lecture, how many people here actually had ever heard of O.P. Smith? About five or so. OK, well, my mission tonight is to make you remember who this guy is, because he really is one of my heroes. Uh, O.P. Smith class of 1916 is almost forgotten today. It's a shame. Marines talk a lot. 
about the Chosen Reservoir campaign. It really is one of the great moments in marine history. But ask a Marine who was in command there, as I did recently in my office, talking to a Marine Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel, he said, I don't know, Chesty Puller, Ray Davis? Uh, no, it was O.P. Smith, Oliver Prince Smith, who even in the Marine Corps is largely forgotten. The decisions he made there, as I promised in the title, saved, depending on how you count them, 10,000 to 15,000 Marines, I would say. I want to talk about him tonight because he provides a fascinating case of what good generalship looks like. I've talked a lot about bad generalship, getting generals fired. He is an example, probably, I think, in American history, perhaps the greatest example of what a good division commander does, especially in an extraordinarily difficult circumstance when your commanders, his commanders above him, were wrong. They were pushing him to do the wrong thing. In fact, interestingly, O.P. Smith is a lot like Chester Nimitz, the namesake for this series. Both men were born in Texas, lived in California at various points in their lives. Both were associated with Berkeley, and both liked the Bay Area so much that they lived out their days here. In fact, also in the 1920s, both lived in the same apartment building in San Pedro, California. You can look it up, the Sunset Court Apartments. General Smith knew and liked Nimitz. I was reading an oral history he gave uh, to the Marine Corps historian, and he said of Nimitz, he was a very fine gentleman, and I admired him greatly. That's high praise coming from Smith. There's very few other people he really praises that highly in his oral history. The Korean War began in mid-1950. In the fall of 1950, O.P. Smith was operating in northeastern Korea, what is now North Korea. And in Korea, O.P. Smith had the misfortune to report to someone very different from Chester Nimitz. His immediate superior was a corps commander named Ned Almond, who in turn reported to General Douglas MacArthur. Ned Almond worshiped MacArthur almost as much as Douglas MacArthur did. <laughs> And in late 1950, MacArthur was dead wrong about the key fact of the Korean War. He believed that the Chinese government would not send the Chinese military into Korea. He assured President Truman of this at a meeting on Wake Island in October 1950. We have the transcript of the meeting. MacArthur later said that was too sneaky to take transcripts of his promises. At that meeting, not only did MacArthur say the Chinese would not intervene, he said if they did, the Chinese would be wiped out by American aircraft. It would be the greatest slaughter, he told the president. But as I will discuss now, that is not what happened. O.P. Smith was not a MacArthur man. He was a Marine. I talked a lot about George Marshall the other night. And interestingly, O.P. Smith was more of a George Marshall man than were the Army generals to whom he reported. There was a fundamental split in the Army at this time, the MacArthur men and the Marshall men. MacArthur and Marshall did not have much time for each other. At one point, um, in, uh, George Marshall and MacArthur were meeting, and MacArthur referred to his staff, and Marshall said, Douglas, you don't have a staff, you have a court. Interesting side fact here is that the Medal of Honor that Douglas MacArthur so desperately wanted, because his father had had one also, was given to Marshall, to MacArthur by Marshall for very cynical political reasons. Marshall figured that since MacArthur had abandoned his troops, or left, had been ordered to flee, ordered to leave his troops at Bataan and go to Australia, that there might be some objections among the Allies about putting this guy in charge. So he said, let's give him a Medal of Honor. It'll make it look like we think he's really brave. So they did. He wrote the citation himself. Marshall and Smith were similar men. They were quiet and reserved. You can almost see the quiet in this guy's face. 
he's not a demonstrative man. He was a pipe-smoking Christian scientist. When he was seven years old, his father, a lawyer in Texas, died. His widowed mother took him to California. She raised him here in poverty. O.P. Smith arrived in Berkeley in 1912, I guess it was, or 1911. He had five dollars in his pocket when he got here. He worked his way through college here as a gardener. Keep that in mind the next time you walk past a gardener here. One of our greatest generals tilled that same soil. He graduated in 1916 and he joined the Marines. Now I said he's a martial man and I mean that not just in sort of personality but actual experience. In the early 1930s, unusually for a Marine officer at the time, Smith attended the Army's infantry school at Fort Benning, which was then run by a lieutenant colonel named George Marshall. Smith there was, and his classmates were instructed in the use of machine guns by Omar Bradley and in tactics by Joseph Stilwell. Smith maintained his reserve through World War II. People tend to forget about the Battle of Peleliu. Uh, Chester Nimitz later said that it was probably the bloodiest amphibious landing in American history. The Marines who uh, did the assault suffered a 40% casualty rate. By the way, if you've never read a terrific book, one of my two or three all-time favorite memoirs, the, With the Old Breed by E.B. Sledge, uh, is half of, a lot of it's about Peleliu. Smith was the deputy commander for the Peleliu landing. On the night before, the landing, which he knew would be tough. He diverted himself by reading a biography of Oliver Wendell Holmes. I just admire that, to have the ability to put aside your worries and read about Oliver Wendell Holmes. So in the fall of 1950, O.P. Smith is commanding the 1st Marine Division. He was ordered to attack north and go all the way to the Chinese border, to the Yalu River. Now there's a saying that the essence of leadership is what a general, well the essence of generalship is what a general does before the fight begins. That is certainly the case with O.P. Smith at Chosen. He made four important decisions in the beginning before the campaign begins. All four decisions grew out of his profound distrust of his own commanders, Allman and MacArthur. Another little noticed aspect of generalship is the task of understanding the people to whom you report. Every general reports to someone else, either another general or at the highest level, the president, a prime minister, the leader, the king. A good commander will think about, what, are that, what is that person above me? And you, any, any of you who go into the military should think about that. What are the concerns of the person to whom I'm reporting? What are their equities? What do they want? What are their skills? What are their shortcomings? MacArthur was exceedingly poor at this. For example, at one point in 1944, lecturing Franklin Roosevelt on politics. This is like an amateur chess player lecturing a grandmaster on, on chess. MacArthur also was not very good at understanding the temper of Harry Truman. A significant aspect of the Chosen Campaign is that Smith began it by soberly assessing the combat skills of Lieutenant General Almond. Almond had a good record in World War I where he commanded a machine gun battalion. He had a lousy record in World War II as a division commander. Asked about the failings of the division he commanded, he blamed it on his soldiers, never a good sign. In this case, Almond, a Virginian with a deep streak of racism in, in him, blamed it on his soldiers. He commanded a segregated black division. He said, black Americans just didn't want to fight for this country. So the four decisions Smith made. First, he insisted on consolidating his regiments so they could support each other. And to explain this, I'm just going to draw a little diagram here.
This red represents the chosen reservoir. And by the way, I'm using the term chosen because that's what the US military maps at the time. It's not actually what the Korean name is. It's the Japanese colonial name. Here's the west side of the reservoir. Here's the east side. The initial troop layout was that Smith was told to put his troops on either side. Um, he had two regiments up ahead to put one regiment on one side, one on the other side. Smith insisted on consolidating his force, getting the 5th Marines out from the east side of the reservoir and bringing them around. The east side of the reservoir was then turned over to the Army with disastrous consequences for the Army Regiment. Second, Smith made it his top priority to have his engineers scrape out two airstrips, one here and one about here. Mark them like this. This was an incredibly important move. It meant that when things got rough, he could fly in supplies and reinforcements. And he could fly out his wounded and not have to try to haul them out. Ultimately, 4,300 wounded were flowing out of this airstrip in a five-day period. Allman told him to forget about the airstrip. Why would you want an airstrip, he said to him as, as Smith was trying to get it built. Smith said, in case I have casualties. Allman said, you're not going to have any casualties. Don't worry about it. Allman, by the way, in his oral history, given many years later to the Army, lies about this. And it's, I found the evidence for the lie because you can go back and read Smith's letters to his wife at the time in which he's saying a month before he goes in, I'm not heading north without, without some airstrips here. He had told his wife he was going to do it. Almond later claims it was his idea and he had to make Smith do it. I do not believe Almond. Third, looking at this layout, Smith decided to locate himself right there. You always want to have a sense of what the key point of action is. Smith decided that was the place to be. He understood that if the Marines held up here but lost this key junction, this is the only road to the sea. If you lose this, it doesn't matter if you win up here because you're just cut off and isolated. You've got to hold this junction. You've got to hold this airstrip. So on the morning of November 28, 1950, he left his rear headquarters and flew to that junction by helicopter. That spot, he ordered, would be held at all cost, which is not an idle term. It meant we die here if we have to, but we're not, we can't give that up. Allman flew in to visit Smith here, looked at the map here up to the Yalu, another 100 miles or so, and said, and I quote, because we have records of these meetings, quote, we've got to go barreling up that road. Smith bit his tongue, waited till Allman left, and then turned to his staff and said, and I quote, we're not going anywhere until I get this division together and the airfield built. He wanted to consolidate his forces, remember. Smith also wrote a personal letter to the Commandant of the Marine Corps, a very unusual step, several echelons of command above him. He put his unease on the record to the Commandant. In his letter, he writes, quote, our left flank is wide open. I have little confidence in the tactical judgment of Ten Corps, Ten Corps being Almond, or in the realism of their planning. There is a continual splitting up of units, an assignment of missions which puts them out on a limb. In fact, at this point, Smith's Marines had a gap of 80 miles on their left to the next American unit and 120 miles on their right. They were out here alone just the Marines on the west side and that one army regiment up on the east side. Smith so distrusted Allman's understanding of combat and of the situation that he made his fourth decision. Expecting that despite the order to attack that he would be forced to retreat, 
he established along the road back to the sea three fortified base camps with about one day's march apart, loaded with supplies and well protected by small infantry detachments. Smith's distrust of Almond is well known to historians. Less recognized is that he also distrusted his own Marine Corps chain of command, though to a lesser degree. And with these actions, these four decisions he took, he was bucking his own chain of command, the Marine chain of command. At the beginning of November, he had met with Lieutenant General Lemuel Shepard, chief of the Marines in the Pacific. He had told him his concerns about Almond. Shepard told him to get with the program. Shepard said, and I'm quoting from the oral history Shepard gave to the Marine Corps, I talked to him and I said, OP, play the game. Don't get so mad with Almond. He's trying to do the right thing. Shepard believed, by the way, correctly, that he would be the next commandant of the Marine Corps. And I think he probably did not want to rock the boat much at this point and make it appear like he could not get along with the Army. Also, old boy networks, Shepard was a VMI, VMI man, Virginia Military Institute, as was Ned Almond and Ned Almond's chief of staff, uh, Clark Ruffner. Even as Almond was telling them to charge north to the Yalu, the Marines were collecting disturbing intelligence. The Marine intelligence officer, by the way, this is why having people posted overseas can come back and be handy. The Marine intelligence officer for the division spoke Chinese and had lived in China. They were noticing that the children, the Korean kids who had been begging them for candy constantly, had disappeared, not to be seen. Deer were moving down off the ridges like they were being displaced by something. When Smith learned that the Chinese had left a bridge intact over a chasm, he was alarmed because he believed it must be part of an enemy plan to lure the Marines northward toward the Yalu. When another army general was visiting and a junior intelligence officer was asked to brief on what they thought the Chinese were doing, the <laughs> The Marine intelligence officer said, sir, all I can tell you is there is a shitload of Chinese in those mountains. So it's, not, it's not a technical term, but I think it described how the Marines were beginning to feel at this point. We now know that Marines, the Smith's suspicions about the Chinese strategy are exactly correct. Over the last 20 years, interestingly, the Chinese have released a lot of documentation about the Korean War, and a lot of it's been translated. We now know that on November 13th, 1950, about two weeks before the Chosen Campaign began, Marshal Peng Duai, and I, forgive me for my pronunciation, the, who was the top Chinese commander in the war, had called together his subordinate commanders for a campaign planning meeting. He said at that meeting, quote, we will employ a strategy of luring the enemy forces into our internal lines and wiping them out one by one. Job one that he put before his subordinate commanders was wiping out the Marine force. This was explicitly decided that the, what they wanted to do was send a message to Uncle Sam, we can take out the Marines, we can take out anybody, you don't want to do this. Get out of North Korea. Chinese commanders were told to quote, encircle and exterminate the US Marines around the reservoir. This is how the battle began. On the night of November 27th, the two Marine regiments isolated at the northwest side of, of the regiment. You see, it says 5th Marines, 7th Marines, around Udam Ni on the west side there. Uh, they were attacked by two Chinese divisions. Each of those red arrows up there represents a Chinese division. So you got two regiments being attacked by two divisions. Then look down to the left uh, where you see another People's Liberation Army regiment coming in and attacking behind them to cut their lines. And you see below that a fourth division is coming in to Hagaru-ri, this key 
junction point, and another one is coming in above Kotori to try to cut there. That is a whole lot of Chinese coming after this one Marine Division. On the east side over there, you see there's the final Chinese division attacking the army units, 132 Infantry, 331, basically a regiment size task force on the east side of the reservoir, put in there to replace the 5th Marines who Smith had moved over to the west side of the reservoir. I also just want you to note one other thing on this map. If you look on the left side, um, can you see where Fox Company is? Yeah, it says F7 Marine right above Sing Nung Ni, that little green, that little blue circle there. That's important. The confidence of the Marines to the initial wave of attacks was really striking and infectious uh, between the troops, between the Marines. The Marines were very self-confident about this. They knew they had lavish and accurate close air support lined up. Army soldiers and Marines had chosen both recall in interviews looking down from, from ridges and waving to the Corsair pilots below them. That's close air support, when you can look down and, and see the pilot coming through. At night, when those planes could not operate, Smith had ordered a lot of fast artillery standing by, preset to fire on the draws, the little valleys in which the Chinese were most likely to launch night attacks. Smith called up Chesty Puller, who's down at Kodo Ri, and asked him how he was doing. And Puller, who was not a joker, responded with no irony, fine, we have enemy contact on all sides. Combat is an extremely difficult thing to go through. I actually think it's almost a form of walking collective psychosis. One of the hardest places to be in this whole thing was that little blue circle where you see Fox Company, F-7 Marines. The 7th Marines, Fox Company. They'd been dropped off to try to hold that key pass you see there. It was a reinforced company, I think it was about 220 Marines. They were surrounded on their little uh, hillside above the pass. For five days, they were resupplied by air while they held off enemy attacks. They built barricades of boxes, of trash, and of Chinese corpses, frozen corpses. It was so cold that wounds remained pink instead of turning brown and coagulating, they pink and red, because the blood froze before it could co coagulate. The Marines also killed the wounded Chinese around them, uh, made no bones about it in subsequent interviews. It was so icy one morning that one Marine recalled that the milk had been heated up and it was poured over cereal in bowls. By the time he sat down, the milk had frozen. It was about 24 below zero at night and windy. One Marine in this fight, not at Fox Company, but in another fight, discovered his foot was aching. It had been so cold he couldn't really feel his feet. And he was hobbling along and a medic said, sit down, I want to look at your foot. The medic took off his boot, looked up and said, and I'm quoting, you dumb asshole, you're shot. He had a bullet in his foot and hadn't known it. He just thought it was aching a bit. Fox Company, 220 Marines, over the course of five days, killed 450 Chinese soldiers, most of them just at, at arm's length away. The Marines at Udom Ni made two attempts to move down and relieve Fox Company through the road, but there were so many Chinese roadblocks thrown up by the, these divisions coming in. You know, it's not just those two arrows, what you get is the divisions breaking down and, and establishing a series of roadblocks. That both attempts to move south and open up the pass and res rescue Fox were thwarted. But they were being supplied, they were getting food, ammunition, medicine in by air. Finally, in one of the really striking moments, uh, another great Marine General, Ray Davis, at this point a battalion commander, lieutenant colonel, 
was told to try to attempt to relieve Fox Company by going overland. And so he goes east of that blue line and takes his battalion over several icy ridges through knee-deep snow, some of it so, so steep that they have to, have to pull themselves up by roots up the hills. Uh, and they march for 24 hours and come in and attack the besieging Chinese forces from behind and come in and relieve Fox Company. That then enables them, uh, others, to come down the road once the, the Chinese forces have been driven off and open up the road for the retreat. That was the next step. Almond agreed. Yeah, you know, after a couple of days, he said, this attack thing isn't working so well here. He agreed that it was time for the Marines to retreat. So the two Marine regiments up on that west side of the reservoir had to get from their outpost down to the junction where Smith and his airstrip were waiting. It took these two regiments, the 5th Marines and the 7th Marines, four days and three nights to fight their way 14 miles to Hagaru. Seven Chinese roadblocks, big, sophisticated, heavy roadblocks, blocked the way. Moving carefully and slowly, which is the way you want to retreat, the two regiments brought with them 1,500 casualties, 600 of them stretcher cases, as well as their dead. First, they stacked all their dead like cordwood in their trucks. When the trucks were full, they tied more dead across the hoods of their vehicles. Finally, when the hoods were covered, they hung the dead Marines they were bringing out from the barrels of their artillery pieces. They fought their way, as I said, four days and three nights. They marched into Hagaru, finally. When um, Smith was sitting outside having a quiet talk with his chief of staff, and it was snowing, it was night. He said it was actually quite lovely. It was quiet for a moment. And he said he heard a bunch of voices singing. And this is the great thing, if you will excuse the phrase, marine macho bullshit. These guys have been through hell, right? They march into Hagaru singing the Marine Corps hymn in formation. It was not inevitable that they would be able to make it out. Remember, look at all those red arrows. Each one, each one of those boxes is a Marine division with orders to get these guys and wipe them out. How do we know it was not inevitable they would not make it out? Well, see those little blue circles on the east side of the reservoir? That's the Army unit, regimental combat team up there. They were in an unfortunate position. They didn't have a general leading them. And they were an Army unit, so they were more beholden to General Almond. It was more necessary for them to follow those orders. General Almond flew up there to that middle little blue squiggle, and that re represents an isolated unit, and tried to talk them. But at this point, the regimental commander was dead. He'd been replaced by a lieutenant colonel named Don Faith. And he said to Faith, well, Faith said, look, I think I'm facing a full Chinese division. That's what it feels like, and he was right. So he's vastly outnumbered. And Almond flew in and said to him, and I'm quoting again, don't let a bunch of Chinese laundrymen stop you. Never was such racist advice so ill-advised. <laughs> Eventually, this army re re regiment, like the Marines on the West, tried to retreat. But Almond had been put in command of a battalion, having never commanded a battalion, a company, a platoon or a squad in combat. In fact, he had never been in a battalion, platoon, company, or squad. He had spent World War II as a general's aide. He had been promoted to lieutenant colonel while having never been in a combat unit except at the division level as a general's aide. And I think this was just criminal. He looked good, but he wasn't very good. And I'm always wary and scared of a military that looks good but doesn't know how to be good. When I say didn't know how to be good, what didn't he know? He didn't know how to organize a retreat. He didn't know how to protect your flanks in a retreat. 
He didn't know what worked in a retreat, which is bring your firepower with you, all the firepower you have. He didn't even, we know this for a fact, he didn't even use the radios he had available to talk to the marine air over, over his head to ask them about what was down the road along his line of retreat. They would have told him, just nobody asked. The word never came through. The Army Regiment tried to retreat. Faith was killed. Of the 3,300 men who were on the east side of the reservoir, 90% were lost, killed, um, wounded, missing, or taken prisoner. The 10% who survived and got out did so generally by walking out onto the ice of the reservoir, which is frozen solid, of course, and walking south. And a little known act of heroism, a lieutenant colonel named Olin Bell, a marine lieutenant colonel, a support guy, a, um, a transport officer, uh, and actually a former minor league pitcher, um, took some jeeps, put, put stretchers behind them, and drove out on the ice to police up the uh, wounded, the walking wounded coming in. Did this for two full days. And finally, actually, went to the spot where the convoy had come to, the retreating con army convoy had come to its end uh, and had been torched by surrounding Chinese troops uh, and actually counted the dead and so on. Interestingly, the Chinese never fired on him at this point. I think they kind of knew what he was doing. We're just coming in, trying to figure out, he was seeing if there were any survivors up there. There were not. So, at this point, finally, Smith has consolidated his forces here. He's brought down two regiments here. He has, I think, a battalion minus here, not a whole lot of troops, and he's got the survivors off the east side. The next step was to walk at the bottom of the Y to the sea, about 40 miles away. On December 6, Smith had about 10,000 Marines and a few hundred Army troops at that, this wide junction. They began their march south. This was planned even more carefully than an attack. People always talk about the Marines saying, retreat hell, we're just attacking in another direction. It's not just boasting, because normally when you retreat, you're just running away from the enemy. Here, they were running into the enemy. They still had these divisions down across their line of retreat, and this was the only road out, so the Chinese knew they'd have to come through there. He had a 1,000 trucks, tanks, and other vehicles in his column. But he ordered that no one walked except drivers, radio men, medics, and the badly wounded. Just because you had a bullet in you did not mean you were badly wounded, by the way. Everyone else would walk for two reasons. First, the better to stay warm. People were freezing to death. And second, to ward off enemy attacks, to stay alert to stay be up on the ridges. Smith actually said he was quite confident coming out. and never had any doubt about it. And his explanation was this. This is actually uh, an explanation he wrote for the Marines. This was a very powerful force. It was well supplied with ammunition, fuel, and rations. It was powerfully supported by Marine and carrier-based air. Possessed organically artillery, tanks, and the whole gamut of infantry weapons and had dedicated officers and men to carry the fight to the enemy. And that's what they did. It took 39 hours to fight their way to Koto Ri. In the, the course of this fight, that's 11 miles from Haguru Ri to Koto Ri, they suffered an additional 600 casualties. There were nine roadblocks, almost one a mile, uh, once you were a mile out of camp and, and then a mile before Koto Ri. So basically, every mile a major roadblock. Smith again said, let's move carefully and slowly. We're not going to leave behind Marines. We're going to attack and clear spots before we try to move through. This will not be a route. General Almond, and by this point, you get the sense I don't really like this guy. General Almond doesn't like that. He flies over the Marines where it says Hellfire Valley. He flies over them, and he's outraged to see the Marines stopped and moving slowly. He lands his aircraft at Koto Ri and braces Smith 
and lectures him on the need to move rapidly. At this point, I think Smith demonstrated his greatest self-control. He did not strangle Almond. At Cote Ori, Smith collects the third of his regiments, which it was there keep, keeping that area open in another airstrip there. They finally have a very weird battle there in a raging snowstorm, a blizzard. One Marine wrote, quote, the tracers were weird streaks of orange that flew out, flew out at us from blinding snow clouds. A firefight in a blizzard. You can't even see the enemy. All you know is you're getting shot at by these bullets coming through. Ultimately, of course, the Marines made it out. They got to sea. They got on Navy ships. Had O.P. Smith not made these hard decisions and stuck to them, decisions which likely risked his career, I believe at least 10,000 Marines and probably 15,000 all told would have been wiped out. It's not just my opinion, it's the opinion of some of the other generals who were there, like uh, Ridgeway. Think of what he did. It would have been easy to simply follow his orders. But he believed his orders were wrong. If he had simply followed them, done the easy thing, this probably would have been the greatest military disaster in our history. 10,000 Marines lost. That's little bighorn times 50. Think of the possible implications of that. It's not just embarrassing, it's not just bad, it's not just a military disaster. If the 1st Marine Division had been wiped out, the course of the Korean War probably would have been far different. Possibly the United States would have withdrawn from the peninsula and become isolationist. More likely, the Douglas MacArthur would have prevailed in his desire to use nuclear weapons. Uh, he had asked for the use of 36 nuclear weapons against the Chinese along the Yalu. Neither prospect is very appealing. The Chinese suffered great losses. Out of the total of 12 Chinese divisions that ultimately were thrown into the attack, there were 25,000 Chinese killed, 12,000 wounded, and tens of thousands more frostbitten. One of the really sad aspects of this fight is one of the division, Chinese divisions thrown in had been a tropical fighting division, I believe based on Hainan Island. They, were, they had sneakers and uh, cotton jackets. And they literally were freezing to death where they sat, even when they moved. Uh, Ray Davis in, talks about coming across a Chinese soldier in a foxhole. You can see he's alive, but his eyes, because his eyes are moving, but he can't move. He's, he's basically frozen, and he did freeze to death. The Chinese forces thrown into Chosen were withdrawn from fighting until March of the following year. So in tactical terms, this ultimately was a defeat for the Chinese. The Marines will tell you, we won it, Chosen. Yeah, um, they did not achieve their, their, their mission, the, the Chinese, but it was a strategic victory for the Chinese. Remember, the communist Chinese government had only taken over a year earlier. And a year after taking power, they were confronting post-World War II's great power, the United States, and they forced it to retreat. Now, I think this was really China's stepping onto the world stage. You know, these guys weren't just, you know, don't believe Chiang Kai-shek that these guys can be knocked right off. Here they were taking on American forces and prevailing. By the way, I just want to mention, because the Chinese did, did not know about the consolidation, they were surprised to find the army troops there. Um, they didn't realize ar that army regiment had been put up there. I think there's a good argument to be made that the disastrous uh, situation that the Ch army unit had there slowed down that division coming down the east side of the reservoir enough so that uh, the Marines were able to get their regiments down and consolidate at Hagaruri. So I actually think the army um, sacrifice here may have been the thing that enabled Smith to prevail, and it's worth keeping that in mind, especially because the official Marine histories don't say it. One military historian called Smith's performance at Chosen, quote, perhaps the most brilliant divisional feat of arms in American history. I find it really difficult to dis disagree with that assessment. He's a really striking officer. Oh. 
O.P. Smith's career after that point was unremarkable. He retired from the Marines in 1955. He lived quietly near here for another 22 years, and he died on Christmas Day, 1977. Please join me in applauding him. The question is, what kind of reputation did Ned Almond have before the campaign? Um, basically, a tough, not very smart, but a tough commander. Uh, interestingly, Matthew Ridgway, who comes in um, not long after this and becomes the American commander uh, in the Korean War on the ground, fired a whole bunch of generals. He did not fire Almond. He said, the only problem I've ever had as a corps and army commander is generals who aren't aggressive enough. And the one thing you know about Almond is that he'll always be aggressive enough. To which another general famously, or another officer famously responded, you can always count on Almond to be aggressive when the situation warrants it. You can also count on him to be aggressive when the situation does not warrant it. <laughs> But Ridgway said that's not bad. And in fact, it, it goes back to something I was talking about earlier today, Winston Churchill's saying that the one thing he would never fire a general for was being too aggressive. That they might lose people, but aggression in warfare, consistent, determined, persistent aggression is a terrific quality to have. Personally, I actually think um, Almond was not all that. I mean, I'm really struck reading his oral histories. He just he really comes off to me as a big jerk. Yes, please. Con oh. Considering uh, the next comment, Colonel Shepard's advice to uh, Oliver Smith, which Smith did not take, um, and subsequently uh, Smith's career, which was rather bland after his career as the first Marine Division commanding officer, did that have any reflection? I mean, Shepard's, uh, in other words, was Smith recognized at that point in time at all? Uh, not really. And in fact, his uh, daughter, I think his adopted daughter, uh, wrote a biography of him, which says there actually was a little bit of bitterness about this. That um, Smith commented to her one day later on in retirement, he said, you know, they, they invite a lot of officers to come to Quantico to lecture at the Command and Staff College on Chosen. He said, they've even invited officers who weren't there to lecture on Chosen. He said, they've never invited me. And in fact, I think he was somewhat distant from the Marine Corps in his retirement. In his oral history, they, they, he's asked, what has been your relationship with the Marine Corps since you retired? And he says, not much. Um, he and Shepard uh, have been kind of rivals. Uh, and I think he thought Shepard played Harry Truman better. Uh, and that, that was why Shepard became the commandant. Um, th there was, he, he's such a, a gentleman, I wouldn't call it bitter, but I think there was a bit of puzzlement that he was not more recognized even within the Marine Corps and certainly outside the Marine Corps for his achievement at Chosen Reservoir. I hope to change that with this book. Yes, please. General Patton was a really aggressive general, but he was, but he was totally prepared and totally experienced beyond, way beyond any of the other officers. That's why he was so good. General Patton was a piece of work. Uh, I really like Patton. I've read a lot of Patton. I've read his diaries. Uh, I do wonder whether he was technically insane. Uh, when Patton sends a task force deep into German territory to rescue his son-in-law and some other POWs, the task force got wiped out. Uh, Patton made a lot of mistakes. Uh, but yeah, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. That's what they say in skiing. If you're not falling down, you're not skiing hard enough. Thank you for coming today, Lieutenant Hutchins. 
Um, you talked a lot about uh, O.P. Smith's strategy and his relationship with Arnold. What about his leadership of his own men and his subordinate commanders? Did you come across any of that in his research? And did they always get along? And what did he say to them when Arnold's telling them, hey, we're going to hard charge? And he says, no, guys, we're not going to do that. Yeah. It's a good question, actually, because um, the record is a little bit mixed. Um, he had three regimental commanders. Puller, his most aggressive one, is down south, down here. Up in the northwest, he has uh, Ray Murray and Homer Litzenberg. Uh, Litzenberg, he didn't much like. He thought Litzenberg was a grouser. Um, and he thought about relieving him, but decided against him. Um, he said just, he, he says in, in his oral history, <laughs> Litzenberg's a bellyache. He's always complaining about stuff. He didn't like him that much. And an interesting problem also here is an interesting sort of situation. He's got the two regiments up here, right? He puts neither one in command. He actually says, you guys are up there. You figure it out. And they actually had command of the two regiments by basically handshake and cooperation. They discussed together what to do, but neither one was in command, which generally would be seen as a terrific mistake. I think because he understood his subordinates, and also because if he had to put one in command, it would be Litzenberg, he didn't. A risky move, one that goes against the conventional wisdom, have one person in charge. In this case, it worked quite well. So I think know what the rules are, but also think about when to break them is the lesson there. Uh, he also knew that Ray Davis was up there, and Davis was a terrific battalion commander, and that he'd be used well. The reason, by the way, typically in a division, you'd have an assistant division commander around. Uh, as it happened, that the assistant division commander had been sent home to the United States because his father had just died. He was very close to him. And so he had no assistant division commander present. Uh, and so he just left the two regiments up there without one in command, and it worked out for him. He had a very good chief of staff, by the way, Alpha Bowser, if I recall. And he and Bowser worked very closely together, talked constantly. But most of all, what I would leave you with on the command relationship is the terrific confidence that he expressed and that permeated down to the lowest level. You'd see comments that he made would be repeated. You see it in memoirs. People would pass down to the company level. Oh, yeah, General Smith came through yesterday, and he said, he said this. Um, his battalion commanders were very good about constantly moving and talking to the troops. One of my favorite moments is as they're finishing the retreat with the, the bridges at Koto Ri, where they actually had to airdrop bridges in. It's still very cold, but they know they've made it out. And Ray Davis runs into a young Marine he knows. And um, they have the most casual conversation. Hey, how's it going? Great, you know, Colonel. And um, they just talk for a few minutes. You know, this is after just two weeks of the sheerest hell. Oh, yeah, the, the young Marine says, things are, things are just great. <laughs> and they actually, as they come down out of the mountains, they're up in this sort of plateau. By the time they get down to the coastal plains, it's almost tropical to them. It's about 40 degrees above, above zero instead of 24 below. Uh, it's kind of funny to watch them as they come out. Um, a lot of the, they're still getting shot at a lot, all the trucks, because the Chinese have been trained very well to shoot at drivers and at the engines. So all the trucks have a lot of holes in their radiators and stuff. They found that these huge Tootsie Rolls that they had were perfect for plugging the holes. So the Marine trucks are coming down with like 20, uh, the radiators have like 20 Tootsie Rolls jammed into them. <laughs> they also found it warmed up the Tootsie Rolls that would have frozen, and so the Marines would walk up and pull them out and eat them. <laughs> Ray Davis recalls when he finally gets to the sea, um, and it's something that people tend to ignore, both here and when they got to the sea, Smith had huge vats of coffee, stew, and pancakes. And he made sure that this was waiting for these guys as they came in because he knew that when they'd be arriving. And again down here, Ray Davis says in his own memoirs, uh, when he finally got to the sea, he realized he really hadn't eaten much in about four days except Tootsie Rolls. He had seven plates of pancakes. <laughs> yes, please. Uh, you've mentioned General Marshall a number of times. Uh, 
even if I'm from Beatnik, Berkeley, I had taken a number of military science courses when I went here. And one of the things they were very proud of about General Marshall is that he came from ROTC. He wasn't an academy uh, person. Also, I think he was, v he was not ROTC, he was VMI. Right. And was commissioned out of the Virginia Military Institute. Right. So in effect, he was a ROTC, not unlike most people here. But uh, an interesting story that they told about him, a famous conversation between him and Roosevelt, where they were planning the Normandy invasion. They were almost done with it. And uh, it was a question of who was going to lead the invasion. Uh, n uh, no one had been assigned to that yet. And so the president told Marshall, you know, you've been the architect. And in fact, the assumption was that Marshall would. That had been the going assumption of the British and the American staffs. Yeah, well, at any rate, the president tells Marshall, you know, you've been the architect of all of our success. No one else could have done these things except you. And uh, if you want to go and do this, um, I'll give you leave to go. You know, and the subtext is kind of that if he does this, he's going to become famous. If he doesn't, he's going to be forgotten. And the president says, you and I know the name of the chief of staff in World War I, but no one else does. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to go and lead this invasion, um, I'll give you leave to go. And then he paused and he said, um, but I really must say that I couldn't sleep at night if you were not here in the Capitol with me. Mm -hmm. And you can see Marshall's great devotion to his duty and that he stayed in the Capitol thinking that he would be forgotten. And of course, if Harry Truman hadn't insisted on making him Secretary of State, he probably would have been forgotten. Anyway, my question to you as a military historian is, do you know the name of the Chief of Staff in World War I? Um, I'd just I like, actually, to, I'd like to present this to all of you as a gift from the ROTC department I, in 1975. I actually read his memoirs, and they're awful. It's Peyton March. Uh, from what I understand, looking it up, it was a guy named James D. Harbord. No. I think Harbord's retired by that point, but because there's a huge fights between the Army Chief of Staff and, um, and Pershing in Europe, partly over Pershing relieving so many officers, general officers. Uh, great bit of trivia. Uh, when you were relieved as an officer, not as a general, but just oh, they relieved a couple of thousand field grade officers, Officers who were relieved were sent to a chateau named Blois, B-L-O-I-S, I think it's spelled. But the Americans hacked it up and they pronounced it Bluey. And that's the origin of the expression going Bluey. Really? They say, hey, what happened to the company commander? He went Bluey. Uh -huh. The other thing I wanted to ask you is. Let's, let, let's thank uh, our speaker. We will have a reception in the faculty club and he's good for about 15 minutes over there because we've been working pretty hard this week. I hope he's enjoyed it. I have enormously. And I want to so thank Berkeley give, for inviting me here. We need to do two more things. One is to give him another round of applause. <laughs> and the second, the second is to let the Navy, since this really is the Naval Science Show, have the last word. Captain? Well, I want to uh, thank uh, everyone for participating in the Nimitz Lecture Series, obviously, but I'd also like to thank uh, especially uh, Mr. Tom Ricks for, um, for gracing us with his, uh, his, um, his presence and also his very informative lectures over the last uh, couple of days. Uh, not only did he um, spend time here uh, giving a couple of lectures to the public and everywhere else, but he also spent some fantastic time with our cadets and midshipmen this afternoon, some uh, you know, good uh, opportunity for them to ask some pretty thought-provoking questions, I thought, today. Uh, yeah. uh, and then also uh, we had lunch with him uh, you know, throughout the course of the week. So um, Mr. Ricks, thank you very, very much for uh, being our 27th uh, lecture. And uh, we'd like to present you with a plaque on behalf of the cadets and midshipmen to you for, uh, for being our lecturer this week. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.